This morning, we are going to be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 26. The title of my sermon is, Well, I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> we're continuing in our series where we're talking about Jesus giving us the final exam questions for Judgment Day. As we've mentioned before, depending on your translation, he will say, verily, verily, in the King James, or most assuredly, as you'll see this morning. And those are the things that Jesus could not say more strongly to those that are listening. These are things, if we, we need to understand them, on the last day of judgment, when we stand before Him and our lives are brought before our eyes, we need to know these answers. Now, I don't think we're going to push through all of them immediately. I think we're going to break up. In fact, unless the Lord leads differently, we're going a different direction next Sunday. But probably by the end of this fall, we will have gone through all of them. I think it's only about uh, six more sermons to actually cover them, but... I'm not going to do them all at one time like I normally would in a series. Uh, to give you a little background about John chapter 6, uh, previous to verses um, 26, Jesus has just fed the 5,000 on the hillside around the Sea of Galilee, uh, near Capernaum on the north side. I should have probably put some pictures in there for you. Of my trip it's a beautiful we would call a large lake we wouldn't call it a sea but they do <laughs> it, it's a beautiful place and the the land slopes nice and even kind of kind of the way it does off the side of our church here it has a very nice amphitheater feel so that Jesus could stand down below by the seashore he would be able to teach and the people sitting there would be able to hear him well just the way it's shaped so he feeds the 5,000 people that were hungry that were there. After that, he tells his disciples to get into a boat and go on to the other side of the lake. As they're doing that, he leaves and goes up on the hillside overlooking the water and goes to praying in the middle of the night. As he's praying, a storm brews and flows across the top of that lake and the, the disciples are struggling against the wind and they get stuck out in the middle of the water and they can go nowhere and they're literally fighting for life. Well, you know the story well. Jesus comes along in the middle of the storm, walking nonchalantly across the water as if nothing's going on and the disciples are panicking, thinking he's a ghost. And Peter, for some harebrained idea, gets the idea, well, if you're out there, that's where I want to be, not in here. Let me walk out in the water to you. And so Peter goes out and he walks on the water. Then immediately after Jesus and Peter get into the boat from the storm, the storm ceases and they are on the other side of the land. Well, the next morning, the, the people that were watching Jesus and ate from the food that was given the day before go in search for him. And they saw the disciples get in the boat, so they put two and two together and they rushed to the other side of the lake and this is where they find Jesus. And they begin to have a discussion with him. Now we have more information from Matthew and Mark um, about this occasion. John kind of gives you the bullet points. And what we find is in the course of this discussion, Jesus goes back to the west side of the sea again and goes back to his home base town and is preaching in the synagogue and teaches what we're about to read. But in the course of this teaching, needless to say, the people don't get what he's trying to tell them. I hope that we this morning do, because it is vital for our spiritual life. In verse 26, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus tries to pull their focus 
from the physical food that they had just been given at this massive miracle to show them that they need they have a greater need for spiritual food that they have not yet received. He says in this first most assuredly statement, he says, here is a warning I want you to get. This is important. You need it for the rest of your life. The human tendency is to care about the physical. That's not the most important thing. Because the physical is only temporal. And it will die. The most important thing is for you to care for your souls. The warning is our human tendency is to care more about this than what's in here. Let me give you an example. Ladies, I'll pick on you first because Mother Day, Mother's Day is coming up. I want you to think in your mind to contrast the amount of time and effort you spend between your spiritual walk and your beauty treatments. How much time do you spend on doing your hair, getting your nails done, getting your toes done, makeup that you have to slather on with a roller? Boy, am I going to get in trouble. <laughs> what about your injections, you know? To fill things out or to kill things off, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, we've seen what Hollywood tries to do to a body to make it beautiful. But the more they work at it, what happens? Man, it makes it worse and worse. Why do you think that is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I think it is, is they are making such a valiant effort, such an expensive try to improve what's on the outside. But as believers, we know the inside always comes out. And what you see on them, despite their Botox and their injections and, and their slathered on makeup and nails that are about a mile long and all of that, the inside always comes out. You can't forever hide what's on the inside. And even amongst us Christians, we spend often a whole lot more time and money on what's out here than what's on in here. Amen? Let's be honest. Okay, so that being said, oh, I want to tell jokes right now, but I better stay, I better be good. Guys, we're not off the hook either. How much time and money do we spend on our toys or ways to relax compared to what we do to take care of what's in here. I know guys that are willing to work many hours, many hours, so that they have extra toys. I mean, we have it as a statement in our culture, right? The guy with the most toys wins at the end of his life, the guy with the most toys wins, right? But again, it's the same thing. What's the problem? We're never happy, we're never relaxed, we're never satisfied. Because we're trying to fix all of this out here and the inside just keeps coming out. Am I lying? Jesus says we need to pay attention. This is most vital at the end of your life on Judgment Day. I want to warn you the tendency is that you care more about this than this. And if you do, you're in trouble. Kids, Youth, you're not off the hook either. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. In other words, have fun, enjoy life, learn much. But in the process of doing that, don't forget God. But that's pretty good for us adults too, isn't it? Enjoy life, live it to its fullest. God designed it that way so that we could enjoy it and have a good life. But in the process of that, we need to make sure we put number one, number one. Don't forget God. 
and the neglect of your soul. Jesus was warning all of us, don't forget to feed the most important part of you, your soul. Our souls need to be fed and they need more feeding than what we are willing to give them. Drives me crazy when I hear things like, well, my pastor just doesn't feed me. You know what I have to say to that? Even if you say it to my face about me, I'm glad. I'm glad as you leave here, you're still hungry. Because guess what? My job isn't to feed you. This is going to get a little bit harsh, all right? Many of us have been saved for over 30 years, and we're still expecting mom and dad to feed us. It's time we take the spoon away and do it ourselves. There's no way you will make it to heaven living off the fumes that I can give you in a 15-hour sermon on Sunday morning. It just doesn't happen. You have to be self-feeders. And you have to feed what's most important, and that's your soul. I'm pretty good at feeding the other parts of me, right? If I'm this good at feeding this, I better be that good at feeding this. Verse 28. After that, they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus, oh man, I should preach just on this verse, but we don't have time. Jesus said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So then, I mean, that's a good answer. All right, let's ingest that. Let's take that down, Jesus. Let you give it to us. All right, we need to have more information. Let's feed our souls. That's not what they said. Look at their response. What sign will you perform then? That we may see it and believe in you. What work will you do? They just got done eating a big old meal. Where 5,000 people plus women and children got fed in the side of a hill from a little boy's lunch. What other signs should you need? Your bellies are still full from yesterday. But they're still hungry. Because they didn't see the truth of it. He didn't, they didn't get what he was trying to give them. Sure, he had compassion that their bellies were rumbling. But his greater desire was that the hearts that were rumbling would be fed too. They go on and they say, Our fathers ate manna in the desert. Desert, As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Their, their idea was, well, Moses gave us food. What are you going to do? Yeah, we know you gave us bread yesterday. But what are you going to do now? Church, I've heard it over and over again. My Bible is boring. Church is boring. You need not so much to care about what the church can do for you and what the Spirit can do for you. Because at the best of my ability, the best of my preaching, the best of my teaching, the best of any Sunday school teacher that we have here, even if we had Billy Graham himself, that's not going to do your soul any good if the Spirit's not at work. You need to find out what the Spirit can do for you. I grew up in the church. I literally remember in my entire life missing two services. That's it. Two. Two. I remember sitting on mom and dad's bed. I was sick that day. And I remember sitting on mom and dad's bed and I was watching uh, Good Morning America, which was today the news program from CBS. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Because <laughs> like I said, I remember too. But when I got about Daniel's age, I started asking questions like, is what my dad's from saying from the pulpit really true? Or is he just trying to make a bunch of good people? Is it really changing lives? I mean, is there really a God? I'd heard it over and over again. I could recite so many of the Bible stories. Back then, you didn't have, you know, YouTube and all those wonderful things. We had stories on record. Yes, they were records about this big. <laughs> and we'd put them on the radio and we'd listen. We couldn't even listen in the car because, you know, the record player doesn't fit in the car. 
And we'd listen to those Bible stories over and over again. And I could recite you all of the Bible stories from Genesis to Revelation. They were our only source of enjoyment. <laughs> but it didn't do me a bit of good. Because I didn't have the Spirit speaking in my heart. So finally one day I was warring in my mind and I said, Okay, God, if this is true, if you are real, I'm going to hell and I know it because of how I'm living. But if my dad's telling a bunch of lies trying to make good moral people, I'm safe. No problem. But I got to figure out which one's true. And I had a war in my mind. You went to bed at my house 9 o'clock sharp. You did not stay up late. I'm laying in the bed down in the basement and I'm warning in my mind. If I get up and I go and ask my dad the real question, if he's telling the truth, I might get beat. <laughs> the other side to that is God might beat me if I don't. And the conviction kept on rolling and the questions kept on coming. And finally, the thought came to my mind. My dad loves me enough. That if I ask him the honest question. If God is real or not, he will answer me the truth. And if he's just trying to make good moral people, I'll be a pretty good kid and I'll get away. I'll be fine. So I went and asked him, and you know what? I said, Dad, is God really real or are you just trying to make moral people? And you know what he said? I can't tell you that. I was looking for a yes or no answer. That's all I needed. Either three letters or two. That was it. He said, I can't tell you that. But he gave me the best wisdom the world could ever offer. He said, but if God is real, he can tell you himself. So I'm up there in my whitey tighties, knelt down on the couch. And my dad and mom sitting next to me and we pray and they don't pray for me. They make me pray. God, I want to know if you're real. I want to know if you exist and want to live in my life. And the confirmation of the Holy Spirit that came through my heart that day will always and has forever changed who I am. Not only do I know He exists, He exists to live inside of me. And He exists to live inside of you. All of the book learning in this physical world will do you no good. All of the Bible study you could memorize from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22. You could have every word memorized. You could memorize it in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. All of those wonderful languages. And it won't do you any good if the Holy Spirit isn't at work telling you that He's real in your life. You need your soul fed by the Holy Spirit. More than you need your body fed. Most of us will probably survive a few meals without a food. But we'll never exist a day without His Spirit speaking to us. Verse 32. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Here's Jesus' second that we're studying. Second most assuredly warning every good and perfect gift comes from above you can't stir up your own salvation you can't make it you can't build a salvation that'll save your soul it is only the salvation that comes from god god sees you in the darkness sees you lost and he brings his light and offers his light to you if you accept it you will have light in your life if you refuse it your life will be dark period you can't make the light your own. You can't make it yourself. It's only His light that we can receive. Our human tendency is to pay more attention to, again, the human flesh than we do the Spirit. We look for smart. We look for good looking. We listen for orators. We listen for the beautiful voice that sings. But all of that is superficial and passing away. If I had the voice of Taylor Swift, it wouldn't do you a hill of beans good. Because eventually my voice is going to go away. I mean, no better representation of that than Easter morning, right? 
I preach the whole sermon. I go to sing the, the whole song and everything's going well until I get to that last note. And my voice says, ah, nope, you're not doing it. <laughs> Our voices pass away. We can sound good. We can look good. And that's what humanity looks for. But it's all superficial. What we need is what's on the inside. What we need is the true words of God lived out in our life. There's been many people who've been deceived by slick-lipped Satan salesmen. They sound good. They look good from the outside. But what they're giving is lies. Please don't put your faith in me. At best, I am a flawed human being. You can follow me as you follow Christ, as I follow Christ, but that's as far as it goes. If you see me straying, don't follow me. We'll both end up in a pit. As I follow Christ, sure, follow me. But I want you to get his words more than you get mine. We, the tendency for humans is to look at the person, raise them up as heroes while wow, they're doing great, while wow, they're doing wonderful. But you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. They will let you down. If you put me on that high of a pedestal, guess what? I promise you, I will let you down. It's never my intention to do so or mislead ever. But it'll happen. Don't put me up there. Put him up there. Put all of your faith not in humans at best, but put all of your faith in Jesus. Verse 34. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They're still not getting it. <laughs> Lord, yes, we want this bread that gives life. Yes, please give it to us. Jesus looks at him. What's wrong with you all? I am the bread of life. I'm standing here in front of you. I gave it to you yesterday. I'm giving it to you now. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me. And yet you don't believe. The children of Israel that went hungry in the wilderness were the ones that hadn't gone out in the morning to get their food. The manna rained down every night. So that when they went out, except for the Sabbath, to find bread, it was all over the ground. And they could take it, and they could crush it, and they could boil it, they could bake it, whatever they wanted to do. But that's their food. The dummies that were hungry that day was because they didn't get up in time to go get it. Same thing with our spiritual walk. If you're hungry spiritually, guess what that means? You ain't eating what he's given. And it ain't nobody's fault but your own. From verses 37 through 45, we won't read it, but I'm going to paraphrase it, okay? Just for lack of time. <laughs> Jesus tells them that God gave them the bread of heaven and that He was the one from heaven, from the Father, to feed them. He literally says in verse 35, I am the bread of heaven. So, they start to complain about that. They don't like that He's the bread of heaven. They would rather have someone else. How can this guy give us the bread from heaven? Jesus says, don't whisper and backbite amongst yourselves. He says, here's what's happened. God has put a hunger in your soul to be fed. And I've come to feed you. But if you reject me, you're not going to be fed. That makes sense, right? You come in, you pay for your ticket, you go to... Uh, I don't know. What's the place over... On the west side, the big buffet. Golden Corral. Thank you. You go to Golden Corral. You pay your ticket. And you go get your plate. And there's all this food here. And you go and sit down without getting any of it. And then you walk out the door. That's just as bad as walking through a day that God has given you and not hearing from Him. And you know what? It's just as much fault that you don't pull the food off the buffet table as it is that you don't hear when He's calling you every single morning when He gives you breath in your lungs. Sorry, this sounds pretty harsh. Don't intend it to be. But to talk about harshness, Jesus' response wasn't necessarily that 
God put a hunger in you and I've come to fulfill that hunger. Actually, what he says is God put a hunger in you and he sent me down so that you could eat me and drink my blood. And if you do that, you will be satisfied. So the harshness of this sermon has nothing compared to what Jesus said. Me. Verse 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, here's the third one. He who believes in me has everlasting life. This is the same thing he talked about two weeks ago. The belief here is not a belief in practice or not a belief in principle. You have some kind of mental assent that, yes, I believe in God. No, no, no. That's not the belief he's talking about. The belief he's talking about is a belief in practice. I believe it so much. It's changing my life. If you are not willing to believe enough that it changes your life, you're never going to change. Not holding simple information of understanding, but believing so much that you're willing to do to act and to be. Verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life again. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. You can eat physically pretty good. You can eat, actually eat the best from the best chef in the world. And you may, day, you may die as you walk out the door. You need the most spiritual food you can ever get because one of these days, breath will be gone out of your lungs. And how fat and happy are you going to be then? You better be hungry spiritually now so that when you leave, you will be holy in this world. Verse 51, I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, I will they, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us this flesh to eat? They're still not getting it. So now he comes and gives them his fourth, most assuredly. Verse 53. Ah, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. <laughs> mm. Sounds a little gory, amen? We need the spiritual life that is only found in Jesus. Other religions have to work up further, fervor or have some kind of self-indulgent worship service to get people on a high so that they will be changed, that they will have artificial life. Our life comes from us naturally because God pours his spirit in us free of charge. Jonathan Edwards, in the early days of the country, he was not an eloquent preacher. He was not, I honestly think, good. He would take his sermons have every word written down, and he would read them completely monotone. I have known pastors like that. It's very difficult to listen to them in a sermon. He would just read it out without raising his voice. That's all he did. And one day he got in a sermon, and the name of the sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he, as he preached, talking about God holding sinners over the fires of hell. And if their life gets too heavy of sin, he will drop them and they will burn forever in hell. And as he's preaching it, squalls start coming out of the back. People laying on the floor, screaming and crying, holding on to the pew, realizing that God is about to drop them into the fires of hell. And because of that sermon spoke monotone red from the pulpit, the Great Awakening started in the United States. It's not about the presenter or how he presents. It's the words of life that come from Jesus himself to change our hearts. Amen. And that's what we need. 
I was talking with a man that's way up in the Nazarene church this week. Uh, we're talking like top 10 of the most prestigious people in the entire world in the Nazarene church. And as we were talking, he asked me a question and it shook me. He said, outside of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we can mimic or to put on a show, outside of those, what is the one true way to tell that the Holy Spirit is, in, is moving? Hmm. Think about the book of Acts. If we're going to ask what happens when the Holy Spirit moves and you get rid of the being um, having the flames of fire on top of your head, speaking in other languages, uh, miracles. If you get rid of all that, what's the one thing that's left? The Holy Spirit changing people's lives. As the Holy Spirit broke loose in the book of Acts, people were changed by the thousands. Church, is the Holy Spirit at move? I'm not talking about jumping up and down, making a show, acting all crazy. I'm not talking about mimicking something to make it look like I know what I'm talking about or I have something I don't have. Is the Spirit of God moving in us so that it's changing us and those that are around us? Because that's the true sign of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the life we need. The thing that we cannot fake there's lots of gifts that we can fake. We can put on a good mask. But the one thing we can't fake is a close relationship with our Creator. It shows. And it doesn't matter how much makeup you roll on. What's on the inside is going to show through. Verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats of this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? In the verses 61 through 65, I'm going to paraphrase a couple of them. Uh, this is what Jesus says. His words would bring spiritual life, but only if they accepted them. Their problem was, we hear this, it sounds nasty, it sounds gory, we don't want to hear it. And Jesus said, the only one that's going to feed you life is me, and if you're not listening to me, you're not going to get life. Did you realize that the message of the gospel, the Bible, is very unpopular in our culture at this moment? Does, would it surprise you if I told you that people don't like the message that's found from Genesis to Revelation? You know what? If you agree with what's found from Genesis to Revelation, you're not going to be popular either. This week I was at a conference. It was a powerful conference. While I was there, I heard from a friend of mine that there were people that literally had paid money to show up to this conference, that were there at this conference, that were posting on social media blatant lies, that we were being unloving, that we were bashing others, that we hated others, that we were being selective, and it was foolish. It, they actually paid money to show up and then did their best to reword what people said so that they could say what they want to put us, put us down. The Bible message is unpopular, but you know what's crazy? The entire focus, the entire conference, its title was Holy Love. How to love God better and love others better. That was the conference. And they were cursing us to our name. They were saying how evil we were. And you know what's even worse about it? It wasn't the people out there. It was fellow Nazarenes. 
It wasn't the sinners. It was the church folks. In fact, some of them are pastors. The Bible's message is unpopular popular in today's world. And if you believe God's word, you're unpopular as well. Verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus comes down from heaven in person, tells them the truth from God. And they refused to believe. They had the best, the most powerful teacher and preacher. They had the number one, the only messenger from God himself, giving them the truth that God had for them and they rejected it. If they did that to Jesus, guess what? It's going to happen <laughs> to this old boy. I will do my best. I will try to lead you to the Lord. I will give you the best word that I know how to give you. But guess what? If you refuse to believe, it's going to profit you nothing. It's a sad truth. And it breaks my heart as a pastor. Because my goal is to draw us closer to the Lord than we've ever been in our lives from day one. But if we refuse to believe what's written in black, white, and red in our Bibles, it'll do us no good. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? I love Peter's response. It is the cry of my heart, and I hope it's yours. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Your, your words may be unpopular. They may sound icky. And we may not even like what you have to say. But guess what? We're not going anywhere else because you're the only one that has life. Whether I agree with what you say or not, I can't get the source from any other source. I have tried in this world with temptation, my own personal life. I have walked the way of a sinful man. I have walked the way of a lustful man. I have walked the way of a rich man. I have walked the way of a poor man. I have lived how this world would tell me I ought to live. And you know what it did for me? It left me empty and distraught and wondering what else is this life all about? And I hate to be honest enough with you, but I am. I did a lot of that after I called myself a Christian. This world has no light. It has no nourishment. It has no satisfaction. It has no vitamins for your soul. The only one that does is Jesus. So where else are you going to go? I want to leave you with this question. In verse 67, Jesus said, Do you also want to go away. I know his message is unpopular for our culture. I know that his message is narrow and that many do not accept his message. But you know what? That's on them. I can't even to the best of my ability change their hearts or minds. My question isn't for them out there, but the hearts that are in here. My question is for you. Do you also want to go away? If he never gives you another dime and tomorrow you were to starve to death. If he would send you out in the public and make you look like the worst fool in the world. If he would make mockery of you and your life. If he would tear you apart, tear your family apart, tear your job apart tomorrow. Would you still stay? Do you also want to go away? On a deeper level, 
I would expect if you're willing to listen to a boring sermon and preacher like me, you're probably saying, no, I'm not going anywhere. And to that, I applaud you. But on a deeper note, how's your spiritual diet this morning? How much are you being fed from the truth of God's word in your life on a daily basis? I know I've given you these stats before, and so I'm not going to go into depth with them, but I'm going to give you three. Since COVID, since COVID, only 10% of Americans are willing to admit that they read their Bible on a daily basis. 10%. There's what, 70 of us in here this morning? That's not a good number, folks. Since COVID, one out of five Americans has read their whole Bible through from Genesis to Revelation. One in five. One in four admit that they have only read a few sentences total. How's your spiritual diet? If you're willing to get up tomorrow, tomorrow morning and feed this thing, you better be willing to get up tomorrow morning and feed this thing. Because this thing, it'll pass away. But this is eternal. And the only option you got is one of two choices. What's your final exam going to say? Have you become hangry with other believers in the church? You know what I'm talking about. Not angry, hangry. <laughs> Where you're so hungry that you're angry. Like those Snickers commercials, right? You know, uh, the person's just not who they are until they get that bite of Snickers. Is that the way you are with the word right now? You're willing to be judgmental and look down and put down anybody else around you because you're not being fed good enough in your own spiritual walk and you're hangry? Has the church been boring to you? Has the sermon been boring to you? <laughs> Has your relationship with God been silent or cold? Are you not sure what real truth is in comparison to the culture's truth? Well, I have an answer for you. There's only one. And that's Jesus. You want to know what the real truth is beyond what our culture changes on a constant basis? Find Jesus. Is church boring to you? Find Jesus. Is the sermon boring to you? Please, 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 when I preach, find Jesus. <laughs> we try really hard at our church. We do two verse-by-verse -verse Bible studies throughout the week. One on Wednesday night, one on Friday night. We have them live on Facebook or you can show up in person. We also post them all to YouTube later on. We are currently in the book of Acts and the book of Revelation. But just on the YouTube, we have all of the verses from Ephesians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Hebrews, and the book of Esther. All already there. All you got to do is just push play on the YouTube. It's not hard to access. But if you don't find me good, I literally keep a list of Bible-believing, strong speakers and teachers that I personally follow from that I would be glad to give you for your own, to help you in your own journey with the Lord. There is no reason, if there is breath in your lungs, that your soul should be hungry. The buffet is before you. So my encouragement to you this morning is taste and see that the Lord is good. Would you stand with me? Hi everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.